in team are you able to hear you guys are able to hear i'll repeat my name is abhinav i work for walmart labs based out of bangalore and i work for the program management team there with me i have bavin kamani who works with us has died uh, uk and lover of other sites the processes and optimize on them today we are going to talk about our journey and the learnings from that journey in perspective of these three important areas program which can be agile only Agile program. So at Walmart, we, you know, over time, we realize that the regular processes, right, that are available off the shelf, don't necessarily fit into, you know, our kind of working or the existing structure. To understand this better, we have about 130 agile teams who work on few dozen programs with different business priorities. They have different release timelines, but they also have dependencies with them. each other so we came up with this custom process that you may not necessarily find anywhere else and the way we came up with this process is that we kept on retrospecting our own process and found out what is best make sure that every business stakeholder every person who's involved in a project you know has the same vision of the goals so what we do is we get the whole team together as along with all the business stakeholders people who have interest in this project or programs which, which will be dependent on that project and we talk about the key business goals with the team and have a common vision and understanding of what we want to do as a result of that we come up with this top business epics to <coughs> kind of sign off when we say sign off it's not frozen it's something that will revisit later but to start with that that what we have i'll talk about inception process in detail in my later start slide the second step of our process is decide on that they also decide what will be the key contents of that release again this can be revisited and corrected based on the estimate something unique that we have added is called iteration 0 what we realized while we were executing these projects is that there is work to be done for work right we want to set up an environment we want to get some sign offs some teams that have been operating already need a four hour iteration 0 but there are teams that take a week long period to set up their environments their builds to get ready otherwise the first iteration just goes in that we allow our teams to do this iteration zero and then we go to iteration planning which is regular which uh, you know where the teams decide hey, these are these are the key epics that we want to target these are the stories they do a fine detail breakdown of the stories and define their tasks and execute and they start iterating Within an iteration, we have the regular cycle. You know, people daily standups. They relook at what's happening, and eventually they do a demo. I'll talk about this in a little more detail later. And there is regression. You must be wondering what is regression to do there. What we found out is that we have a large e-business setup that's already existing. 
any change to that system has to go through a change control right now. We want to move away from change control. We want to build our process in such a way that there is no change control and we are able to certify. But right now, we have to make sure that any change in the e-business that we make goes through a regression phase. That will be extremely helpful. So what we did when it's a, a service, we have a team that <coughs> charted to build a service that is completely autonomous. So the team plans its iteration, usually a two-week iteration, and they keep building that software. They can deploy it in an in independent environment, not necessarily dependent on anybody else, and people can use that service. And what we could have a set of services which have similar technical goals or similar business charter, they form a group of services. Each of these services teams build their software independently. Now that's fine, we need an alignment with these. We want autonomy, but we also want an alignment. <coughs> so what we do is we define Before we start, these teams start executing, and we build the chart plan. Those stories. So mini workshop on that, where let's pick up some existing stories from a backlog and let's start decomposing that, right? So what happens is that's where you know people will start getting a feel of how do we, you know, implement this into our real life, right? So. In the end, basically what we realized is for any scale, you are looking at macro impact, right? But those macro impact can come only with micro level changes, right? Those changes need to happen at an individual level, at a team level, right? And together, that's what ends up creating a macro level impact, right? So again, from a model perspective, we wanted the vision was basically we wanted team to you know deliver early, deliver fast, on demand delivery. So have that capability, right? Where you know they can get into this whole continuous delivery model. Uh, while doing that, basically, they should continuously introspect, retrospect, what is happening, what is learning. So that learning has to be there within the team in terms of they are learning from what they are doing, right? Essentially, and once they have whatever learning they have. Any takeaways, any experimentation, any output that needs to come as part of their continuous improvement. And this is a sort of a cycle of, I don't know, is there an end to it or not? I don't know, I'm not sure. I don't think there is an end to it. It's all about just making it more and more continuous and just keep empowering the team so that you know they take decisions rather than you know people from the top pushing the process down. Uh, that's about it. Uh, uh, just, just to summarize, uh, so what we realize that we have to sooner or later move from a governance, agile governance based model where we push the changes top down to uh, enablement kind of model where we enable people to retrospect their own processes. The key takeaway is the process has to be retrospected itself and the changes have to be made based on your own situation, own condition. Every business case is different and for us, Right now, this is the optimum solution. So process retrospection is our key learning. And team enablement or governance model is the other takeaway. Any question from the? Yes. So yes. let me answer that. So we, we make every effort to co-locate teams, as Bhavin also said that you know, we we are trying, so, so our model is this now, that development engineers, QA people, product managers, and product project owners are at, at least this set is at one place. Given you know, where we are, the kind of businesses that we are involved in, say for Bangalore office, a lot of business is in US market. So a lot of business will continue to be there and it makes it more effective and meaningful to have business there. The whole effort right now is to make sure that people are in one floor, in one place. That has given us enormous benefit. Uh, we had, uh, one of the examples is that uh, we had these 
support teams, say for network engineering, database, security teams. They were different teams, right, who used to work in different geographies or different offices. Now, as a result of this change, they, they all did this retrospection and realized that they need to create these smaller agile teams, which has a presentation from each of the domains, and they get co-located. They still, you know, work in this horizontal functions where they get to share their knowledge, but from a physical point of view, they're one team, they have one backlog, and they can pick up anything. was to create some sort of a mechanism in which we put these teams in not more than two locations. So it may be practically impossible for big businesses like ours or right. for that matter to co-locate everybody. Uh, but uh, essentially we said, okay, we will use uh, max two locations. So as I said, we allow a level of autonomy, but we make sure that the integration in the life cycle is also defined on, and we have this continuously. The use cases that I was talking about, the vertical ones, are the ones that keep the team binded all the time. And we have also made sure that there is, you know, uh, the way people are hired and employed, they do that kind of management. So I had another question about uh, measuring team sentiment. Can you elaborate about it? Because uh, as agile teams, we tend to glorify the delivery rating or the product owner rating of the demo. But I thought that was an interesting, what does the team feel about itself? So what kind of metrics do you use some sort of a? So it was uh, really simple. Uh, we had smileys, basically. And you know, it's like emoticons, really. And uh, three simple or two simple emoticons, you know. Whether you have a sort of a red, yellow, green kind of a sentiment, right, That's essentially. By consensus or each one on the team, right? Basically, we just expect the team, uh, you know, uh, the whole team to basically come together and come back with one consensus, one yeah. okay. right, essentially. And that happens uh, with every iteration, actually. So what you want to check is, you know, at the end of iteration, it's not about velocity, but it's also about how the team is feeling. I mean, velocity could be great, but the team is basically yeah, coming back and saying, yeah. uh, Just to share an exa uh, you know, experience, personal experience. So I project managed one particular team whose velocity chart was like this spiky, right? their emotion was always great. They always said, we're feeling good. And we were very worried about the delivery from that team. And that was the team that delivered on the same day as I expected. It's, it's, it's a soft thing. We don't know, you know how to kind of, how does the team arrive at that, but it has a value. Uh, sorry, we'll take a question. Uh, a lot of tasks. And they were more looking at the task, and later you transformed into uh, story. So uh, I do see that only few things were added, which is your user story was there, and your impediments uh, and uh, risk and those were there. So how do you really say that still the team was uh, getting a lot of benefit out of that? No, so what we are doing is if you look at the board, uh, what is moving is story, actually. So let's go back to that slide. So if you look at this board, really, each of this uh, sheet is nothing but a user story. It represents user story. So we are not plotting in terms of task, in terms of, you know, as an individual, where my task stands. It is more around, you know, checking the flow of the story. And each, so basically, what this kind of says is that if a story is in a waiting period, it means, you know, UI is yet to take up a story. Right? So these are all stories, and none of the uh, post-its were really task per se. Just to add to that, so it, uh, I'm sorry it's not very visible from where you are. So what the team found out, and of course our coaches helped us realize that any user story flows through some states. And this team realized that for almost all stories, they have these four states where a piece of backend code has to be written, a service has to be written. There's a UI that has to be built. Two, that UI and service has to be integrated. Three, it has to go through quality certification, right? So instead of, they did two things. One, they made the story short so that they could flow faster. Now they could find out 
in what state is this particular story. One of the findings, for example, was that most of our queue, which was getting bigger and bigger every day, was the UI queue. And we realized that most people are efficient in developing backend code, and they're not efficient in writing UI code. And it was very evident the team felt that, and they took the corrective action. So we're making the story flow instead of a task move. It doesn't, from a business point of view, it doesn't mean much. Dependencies are all Yeah. So one of the ways we look at dependencies is we have this inception where we inception phase that I defined, the first state that we have where we identify the first set of dependencies, right? That's one. Two is the use cases that flow across programs, and we every team publishes a plan on when and how they are going to integrate, right? That's two. Three is that we have a concept of user st uh, away stories. So uh, we use software tools like uh, Jira and Confluence, which help us, especially Jira with gr green, uh, Grasshopper, Greenhopper, helps us to build a story in one backlog, have a mapping story in some other backlog, and build a relationship between these two, or a set of stories. And when I build my dashboard as a project manager, I, the first thing I see is, what is the state of my dependent stories? And similarly, the other project also knows what are the in stories. Just one second. One second. Is that uh, complete? And then we'll get there. So, in the inception process, you talked about architecture, right? I would imagine at that time, architecture would be at a very high level. How right. What is your process to break it down into a solution architecture at least? So so the question is, in, during inception process, the architecture that we talk about is pretty high level. How do we break the architecture into smaller components or detailed architecture so that teams can start working on that? So when we do architecture, it also goes through an architecture review board. That's where they look at the external interfaces and the whole ecosystem, where does it fit in? So once that is approved, it is the system architects and the team who then start working on the detailed architecture and flows. And the system architect part of the team? It's, it's yeah, part, yeah. They part are, of the stuff. They are uh, very uh, closely uh, you know, part of these. So that doesn't really mean that you have one architect who's full time into just one team, un unless you know the team holds a very uh, uh, specific position. But most of the uh, architects like are shared between like one or two teams. You know, So a kind of a. Uh, architect for a program, basically, and they are continuously there as part of the, uh, you know, stand-ups or planning or the way stories are elaborated. All of those exercises happens with them, really. You had a question. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Cost planning. Sorry, that was not within the you know, jurisdiction. My jurisdiction to do a cost planning. Projects. I mean, from, from an effort and time based, and yes, we did that. No, we, we, we plan, we kind of project on how, how many people will be required, but then we keep on changing that plan, you know, as and when needed. But in terms of dollars, no, I don't do that. Yeah, yes. So, so related to that is, because um, just based on you, we had an initial thing there that said you had to do iteration zero to stuff to help people set up, which suggests to me that you're having this to ramp up and ramp down teams. Right? So are the teams, are they do they tend to be stable? Um, is that what your demand profile looks like? Or does it kind of go up and down as more spiky? So we have had examples where teams were reprovisioned because you know this project scaled down and this moved off. Typically it's uh, we try to move the whole team as much as possible, but we don't have a policy as well. But it, it happens more like a real time basis. So so we have programs where uh, they don't they have agile teams which don't have a specific charter. They pick up any project and start executing. That's one model. That that's that's one model. The other one is that we have a program and there are dedicated set of engineers for that program. Does QAP and Active Yes. Oh yeah, very much. I mean, uh, so when we say team. Uh, 
the team definition for us is all of these people qa uh, you know architects ui uh, developers uh, product uh, you know the product owner or business analyst all of these people are sort of there uh, that's what we call it as a co-location not just a slice of the team okay so to to add to that there is an important responsibility that our QA teams have is to help the product owner build the acceptance criteria at a finer level. So we believe that they are the best judges of what should be the fine, detailed, granular acceptance criteria. A product owner has knowledge at a certain level and then they help them build and align that acceptance criteria. So they help build the product backlog as well. Uh, So again, the for the automation, the idea was, uh, you know, of course, this is not like a brand new project that is just coming up, right? There's a huge legacy around it, right? So the whole idea was uh, anything that, you know, the team is building, they want to automate those things, right, essentially. So the first focus is to automate already uh, for things that are in queue, right? And if there is a bandwidth or there is a need, then you can have a separate uh, user stories just for automation. So it right. is an essential part of your play. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it, yes, it yes, is. yes, yes. Very, very QA much. plans are essential. One related question. In your address process, you mentioned the inception. Yeah. Right. Question at the end. Right. So you have just said to assume then that uh, sketching and regression is not within the sketching, but we do need to decide. There are levels, right? So. Within the constraints of a suppose a new program, most of the testing for that program, at the yellow lines that I showed in that E2 end-to-end -to -end release, is within the scope of this testing team. But we have a lot of legacy. You know, we have an existing e-business site or number of sites that are already there. So we are periodically making changes to the system. We are making sure that the existing system does not break. We have no big bang approach to replacing an existing site with a new one. So we're doing the in incremental changes, and that is where the regression testing is required. So when we add to the existing one, we have to make sure that. Uh, one last question, because I think we are just running out of time. We just have about uh, one minute. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll take these questions. So how are your teams uh, work defined? Is it just to new feature development or? Uh, they have to handle the support of the current products that they are working yes. on. And if it is so the latter, usually that so screws up the estimates for your sprints, right? You don't know when a bug is going to come, how much you time you'll spend on it. So we, we, we have faced that problem. So our initial plan was that you own what you built forever. So that model still exists, but we have built levels of support between the dev team and so when something goes into production, we have levels of support, L3, L2 support, and then eventually it reaches the dev team. We have a concept of DevOps, takes up the tickets, site ops that takes the tickets. It depends on from which environment the issues are coming. So if it is a production environment, it goes through regular support channels. Eventually it can reach the same team that developed that code. You can just suddenly, you know, meet us actually, and we can talk a lot about it. But uh, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for. <coughs>